Um, thank you for your very generous words. I mean, after an introduction like that, it's tough to do a lecture. And I'm going to actually apologize in advance. This is, I, I've never presented with an image so big. So if my laser pointer is all over the place, this is humongously large but beautiful. So thank you very much for having me here. It's a real pleasure to be here to see many all of the colleagues and uh, here at the great university. So I'm going to share with you my experiences in India, perceptions of architecture and practice. I hope in some way it kind of resonates with the issues we deal with here in the United States. Because architects and designers working in India are really facing an entire gamut of social, cultural, economic phenomena that are molding the built environment at incredibly rapid rates. I can see even in Austin, the place is buzzing. But in the process, the role of the professional Marginalized. So because within conventional praxis, the professional does not engage with the broader landscape, but rather chooses to operate within the specificities of a site, and in the process often becomes disconnected with the context of practice. We use the word context, so we should interrogate this word a little more. So our approach of working in Mumbai, I'm sorry the eye is missing on this slide, has actually been to use the city uh, and the region of our operation as a generator of the practice, so to speak, as a way for us to evolve and approach an architectural vocabulary that draws its nourishment from a more elastic definition of the profession, which sees multiple disciplines as being simultaneously valid and engaging with what I call the kinetic urban landscape of India, of Indian cities, areas, very urban, rural uh, uh, regions and areas. Working in Mumbai has um, made me aware in retrospect, and I think through teaching one has been blessed and one has been made aware, or at least one feels very strongly about a problem that exists in the profession. And I think working in Mumbai has helped me see that quite differently, which is that we construct our problems through binaries, through this imagination of binaries. So the rich, the poor, the state, the private sector, the formal, the informal city is a very easy one and one that's very popular. The idea of the local and the global. I believe that um, these binaries are not productive for us as designers because they make us make our alliances to one of those aspects of the binaries. So we become architects, both in the informal city, become champions for the informal city, or vice versa. We reject that as a proposition, uh, etc. But I think design is inherently about synthesis, and so therefore it is about learning these binaries. And I think we have to be very aware as a profession that that's a massive role we can play through spatial imagination. So for me, this is a very, very critical sort of aspect. Because I think also, you know, evoking local specificity, which has become a big buzz, which is whether it's fetishizing the local craft or local tradition, uh, it's an easy and perhaps a simplistic way to critique the homogenizing effects of globalization. And I think it results in a kind of fetishization uh, of, of the local. Because I think the notion that globalization amounts to homogeneity I think is now a dead concept. It's been flawed for too long and not productive for us as designers. In fact, we're inherent. Because I think differences are about not just about local specificity, but about how these networks resonate and are networked globally. Uh, how these sort of local specificities are networked, uh, these differences are networked and need to resonate uh, globally. I mean, I think for me, Albert Alto is a great example where, you know, uh, he was used as an example of a regionalist. I think what he really did was responded to nature. He began to involve nature, both inspirationally in the organic forms, but also in the way nature and architecture began to create a dialogue within the idiom of modernism, and that resonated very deeply. And that's an example of how one can network and make this. And then, therefore, to do that, one must construct meta-narratives. And I'll come to that in more detail in a second. So in urban India, in our post-liberalized sort of liberalized economy, which started in the 1990s, is characterized by physical and visual contradictions that coalesce in a landscape of incredible pluralism. And within, uh, with the sort of globalization that's occurring with the emergence of post-industrial service-based economies in Indian cities, urban space has been fragmented, polarizing the rich and poor, uh, and the state has more or less given up the responsibility of projecting an idea of India through the built and physical environment as it had done in the past in the post-independence era with several state capitals, government and education campuses across the country, narrows construction to 
got Jose or Chandigarh and all of that. Today, the major state-directed projects are highways, flyovers, airports, telecommunication networks, and electricity grids, which connect urban centers but don't contribute to determining or guiding their physical form. In India's post-liberalized economy, cities and their peripheries have become sites for the shifting of responsibility between the state and the private sector. Uh, and it's sort of resulting in evolving new relationships which are sort of in the process. Because today, private capital chooses to build environments that are insulated from their contents without the burdens of facilitating citizenship or place-making which is necessary in a real city. These gated communities take the form of vertical towers or horizontal suburban conditions, uh, etc. We are all familiar with that everywhere around the world. In fact, in this sort of state-controlled economy, the physical relationship between different classes was often orchestrated according to a master plan founded upon entitlement, housing, proximity to employment. In the new economy, the fragmentation of services and production locations has resulted, at least in our cities, and there will be an implication here too, in a new bazaar-like urbanism that has woven its presence through the entire landscape. And I think this shift, of course, challenges our role as architects, and we've got to be. This is, these are the kinds of meta-narratives, I think, that we need to sort of construct. So if you look at India, it's interesting. The seven megacities is what you will generally know of. There are 28 tier 2 cities, and we might be able to name a few within those. I mean, even my Indian students at the GSD, they can never go beyond about 20 names, uh, because these are completely off our radar. And there will be almost 400 cities, which are projected in 20 years to be a million people each, which means 400 million people are going to live in Indian cities, which we don't even talk about today. Now, this is a massive question for us uh, within the profession because uh, you know what does it mean uh, uh, for the role of the architect and how does one expand how does one sort of expand uh, the role of the architect uh, within this sort of um, condition and, and, and situation uh, and, and you know I mean I think this idea of what is the role of the architect in the way I'm sort of critiquing the way we are sort of marginalized from this process and we are detached from the context. I think is something that we have to deal with as a profession globally. Uh, how do we construct these projects? I mean, who are our patrons? Uh, are we activists? We initiate projects. Uh, who pays for these? Who supports us? It becomes a really complicated set of questions. Now, within these cities, it's very interesting that in historically, say, starting from the 50s in Chandigarh, there was a very clear spine of architectural awareness, which is what you see in the orange dots which went from Chandigarh, New Delhi, Ahmedabad, Baroda, Mumbai, Goa. And this is where the patronage existed for modern architecture, because this is where the economy of India rested. Therefore, the patrons were all here. And modernism was introduced here through Chandigarh that set and established a certain set of protocols, and therefore the role of the architect. Post-1990, the landscape you see in blue has what has emerged as patronage. Now, in this landscape, the protocols and processes are completely different. Modernism doesn't mean anything. There are all sorts of ancient protocols uh, which have to do with religious practices, which has to do with imagery, which creates an incredibly plural kind of landscape that are occurring. And it's confusing for architects because they just don't know how to pick up the problem, even aesthetically, in a place like this. And so this is just sort of my understanding of this sort of shifting nature of patronage. But I mean, the question really is, as a result of this, is it points to patronage, it points to processes, and it points to protocols. We spend a lot of time talking about the practice of architecture. Uh, we don't spend enough time talking about the architecture of practice. Uh, so what is the architecture by which we can actually engage with this environment as architects? And that itself is an architecture which we need to design, because it opens up all sorts of forms of engagement. And I think this shift is something that globally, in, and, and I think the universities through pedagogy, we, it's a huge responsibility for all of us who are teachers to begin to think about this, to prepare another generation that's going to engage with landscapes where these protocols and processes are going to be completely, completely different. So then we come to the notion of the context. And I think when we talk about the context, 
we are very familiar with you know how we can discern questions of weather <coughs> the monsoon arriving in Mumbai, which sort of completely changes the cultural landscape of the place and not only the climate. And then how do you respond to this? Uh, we're very interested in these questions. How do you make an architecture for a monsoon climate? What are the kinds of elements? Jeffrey Bauer, for example, was someone who led the way. Also the notion of how uh, we now discuss, well, we don't discuss weathering, we discuss weather proofing. Uh, and so our obsession is with double glazing, sealants, uh, how things don't weather rather than how they weather, because we eliminate climate from our imagination. And so climate is very critical to when we construct the context. And then, of course, craft and material becomes important. And then related to that is the notion of time. And therefore, for us, conservation, for example, becomes really critical because you know, that column you see those uh, craftspeople making takes three months because it's lime plaster and you have to layer it, you have to wait for it to dry, and then you mold it, uh, etc. And then, of course, that teaches us about our cycle of materials, and this is how conservation loops back to contemporary practice of the life cycles. Because in conservation, you discover, or in preservation, you discover when two materials of different life cycles touch each other, that's when you have all the problems and how you separate them. So of course this becomes the context. You look at craft, you look at cultures of building, ways of making, and a lot of our buildings are handmade and we very much engage with the craftspeople on these sites, uh, and they therefore then evolve an architectural vocabulary which we believe uh, responds to the context, which is climate, material, crafts, the histories of the land that you can discern and uncreate. But I believe that's not enough. That's not enough. And that's why I think what's more productive for us is also to ask the question, what is the context of the context? What is the context in which this context sits? Uh, and that's when you begin to start constructing interesting meta-narratives which help you make these intersections and give you another kind of nourishment in terms of how you can engage complexities. And of course, questions of inequity and economy become very important. The world's biggest house here, and you see the smallest form of, of occupation which actually happens at the base of that building, which is obscene in what it sort of aspires to. So what are these kinds of meta-narratives? I think a very interesting meta-narrative within, that is the context of this physical context that we're talking about, is the notion of multiple transitions. Now, East Europe, Latin America, India, South Asia, you know, we talk about the economies changing from socialism or communism uh, to open markets, liberal economies, neoliberalism, uh, capitalism, etc. These don't happen overnight. These are transitions that are simultaneous. So India, for decades, is going to transition out of socialism, and for decades, simultaneously, it's going to transition into capitalism. Uh, yeah. So it's going to it's going to simultaneously transition into capitalism. So when you have these kinds of simultaneous transitions. For the agency of design, it becomes a really confusing kind of set of questions because you're responding to two different ideological sets in terms of this sort of landscape uh, of within which patronage is set. It's very critical to understand that, to know what are the moments of intervention. Another interesting one, of course, besides the fact that India is a mutualist democracy and how do you negotiate that, the question of the role of the state, again, patronage agencies of design, NGO, civil society, what does all this patronage mean? Another very interesting one for us in Latin America and India is that aesthetic modernity came to India before social modernity through Chandigarh and Purbuzia and the young charismatic set of first generation architects. Uh, and in the West, of course, aesthetic modernity grew out of the social modernization process. So there is a consistency, or in a sense, uh, that aesthetic was representing a modernization of society. In India, it happened in reverse. And so you have a very awkward relationship with these buildings when we talk about their preservation. But also when we employ that aesthetic, it doesn't resonate often deeply enough with the middle class, etc. And so to understand these meta-narratives, I think, is very important. And I think the books that uh, one was sort of referring to, for me, have been the instrument to do that in a way to create a dialogue in this book, we actually looked at these various models of practice, including models of practice where there were oral traditions, and trying to set up for the architects and students of architecture uh, uh, a kind of understanding uh, that, uh, that these, these were simultaneously valid, and they were, uh, they, were, they were models of protocols and processes that were valid, that young people could sort of engage with. We've also sort of been, sorry, is the mic working? Well, I'll try. 
try to project. No, so I mean, I think these books that you see here are also part of the practice. Uh, some of them, I, I call them instruments for advocacy. Some of them are merely studio books that can find their way into policy, to lobbying with the government and activism that one can be engaged with. Uh, some of them are scholarly, some of them are about the history of the city, to lobby for some uh, conservation legislation. So these are instruments for advocacy because we jump to advocacy sometimes without being mindful of the instruments. And I think that's legitimate practice too. Uh, and these are the different forms of practice that I believe uh, that we should be engaging with as a profession, and especially this younger generation who's here, for whom it will become, I think, even more critical. So this was one of the other kinds of projects that we're interested in. This is called the Who Mela. It's called Mapping the Ephemeral Mega City. This is a incredible occurrence that happens every 12 years in India where they set up a temporary city for 7 million people to live for 55 days. They set it up in 6 weeks and they dismantle it in 2 weeks and it exists only for 55 days. It's an amazing operation. And so what we did was we, we set up an interdisciplinary project which was I mean the first of its kind in the university where you had 5 or 6 schools that were involved in it, 40 students lived there. And the question we really ask is how do you capture an ephemeral city? How do you map it? What can you learn from it? And I'm not, of course, going to go into the details, but that's what exists at the end of October. And within six weeks, that's what occurs. Those are images. That tree is exactly the same sort of profile. And that's where it sort of exists. Uh, and, you know, and this whole city sort of unfolds there. Uh, and it's a sort of massive undertaking. It's the cleanest Indian city that I've ever lived in. It's the most efficient. It has water supply, sanitation, electricity. It has a police system. It has security systems. It's absolutely mind-boggling that, you know, given the state of all our messy cities in India, they actually put this together for 55 days. Now, the reasons of its success are more complex and I can't go into. But one of our interesting findings was that the entire city is made out of these five materials that you see. And that's how they can deploy it so quickly. Uh, and so, of course, for us, it became really interesting to see how those five materials can scale up for such a wide range of typologies to make this thing happen. And, of course, the way the, uh, the, the research is sort of extending itself is now looking at how one might learn from the way this is governed, the different relationships among actors. This is a mapping of the governance system which hadn't been done. But I think what we're extracting from it is things for refugee camps, for disaster, because every response to a disaster is a complete disaster in itself. And <laughs> our to tend to, 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 uh, to focus on the unit and make beautifully intelligent units which repeat. But no one sort of looks at site planning and the idea of this becoming a city. There are refugee camps like in Dabad, which have been around for 26 years between two generations that have lived there. So this imagination for us as a profession for disasters, for refugees, to also imagine these as urban systems, as urban ecologies, not just concentrating on the unit which is, which is repeated to finally make a camp. And so I think this research sort of extends itself into that and also understanding how it's dismantled, the material is recycled and you know the Ganga floods every year at the end of this and it washes out the whole city, it leaves no memory. Therefore it's an ephemeral mega city which is completely uh, mind-boggling. But then when we come to our sort of our actual cities, uh, you look at Mumbai which is really, it's interesting because Mumbai unlike many other cities in the world is a landscape. Uh, which is about negotiating uh, global flows, because global flows don't erase and remake landscapes as it happens in many parts of China and other parts of the world, but they are, they are forced to occupy local fissures, creating fascinating hybrid conditions and very startling adjacencies. Uh, and of course, some practitioners call this the informal city, but I mean, I think it's beyond that, because I think it challenges the kind of neat uh, equation, uh, and I think it asks us sort of the question, how we might be inspired by the design intelligence of the informal to act and intervene as designers and activists in our own locality. Uh, but I think there's some specific aspects of this that I've sort of uh, tried to study because Mumbai, as it's now referred to, as in several cities in India and perhaps around the world, in this post-industrial scenario, I think it's resulted in this kind of fragmentation uh, and this kind of coexistence of these two worlds and a kind of bazaar like uh, urbanism uh, that is, it's an urbanism, urbanism that's created by those outside the elite domains of the modern formal modernity of the state. It's what the scholar Ravi Sundaram 
refers to as a pirate modernity that slips under the law of the city simply to survive without any conscious attempt at constructing a counterculture. And now this phenomena is actually critical to the city being connected to the global economy. However, the spaces it creates have been largely excluded from the cultural discourse on globalization which focuses on elite domains of production in the city. So this is not the city of the poor or the regular models of the formal and informal, but it's a kinetic space where these models actually collapse into a singular entity. And I think it's through this space, the space of the kinetic city, that we should focus our attention, this idea of synthesis and blurring. And the question for us then becomes, can we design for this space of architects? Can we actually intervene? Does design have any agency uh, as well, conservationists, urban designers, planners? And can we design with a divided mind? Because it, of course, is about schizophrenia. Uh, is this mic possible to work? I don't know if my voice. There it is. Is he had on a red mode? Oh, if you can even give me this one. Okay, that's great. Right. Right. Yeah, thank you. Oh. Okay. Okay, so. So, so this is a wonderful diagram that I have now. It's called the five stages of squatting. Uh, so the guy, so this guy's in the third stage of squatting. You know, over the years, the summer and the monsoon comes, they fortify themselves and they become part of the landscape. Actually, the whole city is built through these incremental kinds of moves. And there's a whole logic to this incremental. It, it is about buying yourself into the system. Uh, so you bought yourself if you're as secure as what you see. So there's a security index, a security index that's sort of related to it. And there's a whole kind of intelligence that's sort of embedded in the way that happens. But also this notion of how space is occupied. Uh, this is an ordinary street in, uh, in Mumbai, where once a year for the Ganesh festival, which is a massive festival with 5 million people participating in it, that street gets occupied as a community center. That's just made out of plaster of Paris. And behind it is a community hall where you have Hollywood films and you have uh, dinners and dancing. And it's only for 10 days because at the end of the festival, the street goes back to normal. Of course, this happens up because of density, and this map or this mapping shows you the open green space in Mumbai in scale to, you know, you can see New York and even Delhi, and even Tokyo is bigger, where we imagine you have an open space. So, of course, there's a particular culture that comes out of this, and this is a two scale map of Manhattan and Mumbai. And you see in Mumbai how space is fragmented. We don't have a central park in the southern part of Mumbai. And so, you know, we have these beautiful Maidans where the this is this beautiful, this wonderful uh, Indian game that the British invented called cricket. Uh, and uh, it's played on these sort of uh, maidans. But in the evenings, it becomes a venue for weddings. And you can see the wedding is wrapped itself. So cricket pitch is sacred, so no one touches it. <laughs> the club members get samosas from the kitchen, and the wedding gets samosas. And by the morning, it sort of disappears, and it leaves no trace. Uh, and so there's this kind of sense of elasticity in the way the city sort of uh, adapts itself. Uh, and the kinetic city, as I'm sort of proposing it, cannot be seen as a design tool, but rather a demand that conceptions of urbanism create and facilitate environments that are versatile, flexible, robust, and ambiguous enough to allow this kinetic quality of the city to flourish. In fact, architecture is not the spectacle of the city. How does it even comprise the single dominant image of the city in contrast Festivals such as this Ganesh festival, um, <coughs> Durga Puja, and many others, Diwali, etc., have emerged as the spectacles of the city. And their presence on the everyday landscape pervades and dominates the popular visual culture of Indian city. And on the last day, this, these great idols, there are about 300 large idols like this that are immersed, uh, and about three or 5,000 smaller idols. But when this is, idol is immersed, Immersion becomes a metaphor for the spectacle of the city, and as the, as the clay dissolves in the water of the bay, the clay in which the idol is made, the spectacle comes to a close. There are no static or permanent mechanisms to enforce the spectacle. Here, the memory of the city is an enacted process, a temporal moment as opposed to buildings that contain the public memory as static and permanent entities. The city and its architecture don't even have the same meaning, because within the kinetic city, meanings are not stable. Uh, they get consumed, reinterpreted, recycled. The kinetic city actually recycles the static city and creates these sort of new spectacles. <clears throat> it's the opposite of this, which is, of course, don't worry, there's no city like this, it's a 
Photoshop image. Uh, but, um, but it's the Shanghai's and the Dubai's, which I call the landscapes of impatient capital. This is about places that make the arrival and the realization of capital frictionless. Uh, and so then you begin to have a vendor driven architecture, uh, which is brittle as urban form. It, it doesn't put the human being at the center. Uh, and um, it, it, you know, it forces architects to twist and turn buildings uh, because that's what sort of separates them in terms of identity. And I think it is exactly the opposite of the landscape that I showed you in the previous slide. And these are diametrically opposite in terms of an imagination of what the city should be. And so if I had to sort of reflect, <clears throat> I kind of, uh, I lay these out. I think the kinetic city is elastic. It's about incrementalism. It's about the appropriation, the reappropriation, the deappropriation of space. But most importantly, it's about soft thresholds. It's about certain kinds of transgressions, whether it's about temporal landscapes transgressing permanent landscapes, whether it's about the poor transgressing the space of the rich. There is a, there is a generous accommodation which makes these thresholds soft. And I think architecture, finally, is a critical instrument in how in society we as architects harden or soften thresholds in terms of exclusionary and inclusionary processes. And architecture is a critical instrument for that which we should really be aware of because again I think society invests in us to be able to use these instruments in productive ways and it's something that we can't uh, <clears throat> let go. And so it is about blurring these binaries, it's not about hardening these thresholds and hardening the binaries. And of course when we talk about uh, preservation or conservation in a post-colonial situation like Mumbai, this becomes very complicated because in Mumbai, the creators of the environment and the custodians are two different cultures. So when we begin to take English heritage, which is what our conservationists do, they are taking a narrative that's been developed in a context where the creators of the culture that is now the custodians are the same sort of culture. Uh, and in our situation, in a post-colonial condition, they're two different cultures. And so how do you then construct new narratives that can help you engage uh, with new forms of cultural significance and how you construct them? And so one of our sort of uh, works has been about actually introducing the first legislation in India uh, to protect uh, urban areas. And this was in 1995. And it also taught us how uh, most of the narratives about conservation are about the postcard city, about a, a, a lost golden moment in the past as being better than the reality of today. And all the narratives begin to construct that idea, uh, which, yes, the upper middle class, the elite, sort of, of course, jump towards, but it doesn't resonate beyond a very small group because the reality of that same scene today is this. So what does that mean? So looking at this historic district in Mumbai, which is where we instituted the first conservation, we began to then identify what might be the contemporary engines to drive this process. And how do you construct new significances for conservation, uh, rather than begin to fossilize things based on narratives which are about a past that's lost and gone, uh, which is images like that which don't exist. And for example, that statue which you know, has King Edward is no longer there, uh, because of course it was removed by the right wing government to, to erase any colonial memory. And so in this case, what we did was we actually invented a festival. We invented the idea of an art district in a place where an art district never existed, but now galleries have begun to crop up. And we felt that would be the contemporary engine to drive it. And through, I mean, organizing this, this was actually activity on the ground that has activism in a sense, uh, without design necessarily, but with a design imagination, where things were animated in different ways, interstitial spaces were put to use, in this case, for children's activities. Facades of buildings were used as galleries in the outdoor to attract people to display art there. Uh, a famous Indian artist, Hussain, contributed by uh, painting uh, a memory of that horse on which Edward sat, which had been removed as a way to auction it to raise money for the district. Uh, art galleries were set up on the pavements. Uh, paving, improvement of public space came from the money that was actually created through these activities. So this was not the government. The government is not interested in this, it was a group of citizens uh, wanting to activate the area. And then grade one buildings were restored using money from that activity of the festival. And of course, then it, it extends into design imagination. So this is the Prince of Wales Museum uh, that exists in that same area, which had a, a warehouse that wasn't being used. And through some very small interventions, 
Contemporary interventions, we managed to open up 50,000 square feet of art space, which added a massive dimension uh, to the district uh, and the galleries. And this was done in a way that it was reversible, so another generation could dismantle it uh, in, in, in a sense, uh, so that one wasn't being definitive about that intervention, but yet changing the narrative through the intervention of architecture. Uh, and so that became the, the new gallery space within this art district which has a Museum of Modern Art, it has it is the Museum of Modern Art, it has many other galleries. And then very recently we added a threshold space here, which becomes a transition from the public to what is otherwise secured off as a museum. And it becomes a visitor center, which also serves subtly for security and things. But it connects this campus to the art districts. And that had to be done through contemporary uh, design intervention. The grade one building, what we decided to do, or something in stainless steel, which again could be dismantled and reversed. So a kind of contemporary intervention through design uh, uh, in, in, in what is otherwise a uh, you know, historic sort of district. Sorry. And uh, yeah, it was, there were many trees, so we built around it. It's just a very thin canopy uh, in stainless steel. This is where you pick up the bags. None of that is made sort of visible. It's very subtle. It it's a museum. It's very dismantled. Again, the idea that another generation could reverse it with new imaginations for uh, the historic district. And it becomes a sort of gateway uh, to the museum, uh, but a very contemporary gateway. And so this is my carpenter's box, and I'm very inspired by it because it has the pantheon of gods coexisting with Castro, and many other things. <laughs> I mean, in many ways, working in India is about the challenges of synthesis like that. So with that, I'm going to actually show you some projects. I've categorized them into these two, which is for localizing global programs and globalizing local programs. And what I mean by this is uh, localizing global programs is you know programs that we don't have precedence in our own traditions for. So programs like corporate offices, uh, call centers, information technology. We don't have any precedence for this. And so how do you begin to root these to a place? Because this is about impatient capital. People invest from all over the world. This is what's happening with globalization. Today, a corporation can move continents with three executives getting onto a 747 with their laptops, and the corporation is moved. And so how do you make capital more invested through architecture in a place? For us, it was a very important question. Uh, and of course, it's an aesthetic with this kind of globalized architecture. And how does one resist that uh, in the locality, working within and understanding the context of the continent? And then I would say that globalizing local program, programs is a reversal of that, which is sometimes you have local programs which are very specific to a place, a school for a slum in Mumbai. Uh, so a slum for a, a school for a slum in Mumbai, and we tend to caricature these. And you know, clients often tell you, let's make this like an Indian village, let's evolve vernacular architecture, etc. But again, it is these differences and these local learnings which I think if can be made to resonate globally. I think Detroit has the same problems as Mumbai in terms of its inequity, in terms of the marginalization of the poor, in terms of its lack of social infrastructure. And how can one make this resonate is the kind of aspiration at least there. So the first is, of course, a very common kind of condition where in a metropolitan area, people build weekend homes, and they build weekend homes, uh, which are weekend homes for the super rich, in places where you have poor rural com communities, and you begin to start having some kind of polarization. And so this is the kind of thing that happens. This is not one of our projects, uh, but it's the autonomous villa, as opposed to you know the traditional Indian house, which would be where its opulence would be internalized in the courtyard versus a freestanding object, as the Palladian villa, which is symmetrical on all four sides. And you know, this is an example of that. I met the contractor that did this building in a boat and I asked him, who's the architect? When he told me he was going to the site and he said, no, no, we don't have an architect. The client has just given me a picture of the White House of Washington. And, <laughs> so that's what he did. and this became, you know, this document, we can go with beware of dog signs, etc. So of course, this is a kind of business as usual practice, and it becomes kind of the aspiration in terms of the images that people project the upper middle class. And so, in engaging with these houses, we've done a number of houses, and I'm not going to show you too much in detail, but you know, so this was one for a young family, and we managed to, with them, understand how long they would spend here, and it turned out that it'd be 30 days or 40 days out of 365, some long weekends, and that kind of thing. And so, here we convinced them that 
when they were going to be here, they were always going to be out in the outdoors. So the living room could just become a big veranda. And it had light furniture which could move in. And it also became an offering to the village, which means that when they go away uh, after the weekend, that porch is used by the villagers, the caretaker, his family, other people, to sit. There's water there because they put some public taps, there's electricity, and they can use it. So it becomes an offering, which means in a way it softens this threshold that I was talking about. It allows this transgression through a generosity of the spatial configuration. And I must say, you know, this is now a 15-year-old house. There haven't been taps. The caretaker is yet working for the family. His kids have grown up. They've studied in that porch. The daughter has even got married there because it becomes like a public space without really transgressing on the privacy of the owners. Because when they're there, of course, that this privacy is respected. And, and it's a house that we've not compromised architecturally on, but we've added a social dimension in our aspiration. And I think for every project, clients have an aspiration which you have to completely respect. And I think that openness and being on the same side of the table is critical. But you have to also set your own aspirations for the project because they become projects of research which go beyond respecting the client's own aspirations but opens up all sorts of other possibilities for communities, for society, but also for you intellectually. Another one, I mean, these are the kind of typical situations where there are villages, farms, and so here we had to intervene with a villa. This was for uh, the doctor, who's a young doctor who's in, who discovered drug-resistant TB. So he's really well known, very wealthy, and he wanted to build a big villa. I mean, short of giving me the photograph of the White House in Washington, his brief was sort of described it like that. But by deconstructing it, working him through the possibilities, but also talking to him about these questions of social equity, and etc., bringing that as part of the conversation. These meta narratives is important. I mean, tell him, okay, climate material, that was fine, but I mean, I think these are people who are intellectually capable of engaging in a conversation like that. So we deconstructed the house and we put a lot of the services right at the entrance of the property with a clinic, which now he opens on the weekends to service the villages. So that becomes a wonderful communication. And then the house itself is very discreet in its, 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 its disposition. It's first of all fragmented. For me personally, the, this was an exercise in incremental design. That is, how could one come up with a design for a very rich man, which could also be applied for a middle class person, who could build it in bits as units. So in this case, it's a living dining kitchen. This is a bedroom, bedroom suite, which can become one big room for all the family to gather. They're living together, but if they're guests, it can be close to become more discreet. A swimming pool with a study for the doctor and a guest room. But it sits discreetly in terms of its proportion style and the way it kind of alludes to the locality. And as you go through it, it's a series of courtyards which are very open for ventilation, very simple materials, a swimming pool that is very discreet, so as workers are working in the farm and the garden, they're not seeing people hanging around in their swimming costumes, which is another kind of form, form of polarization that occurs in our kinds of society. So it does become a feature, but it also has a sense of discretion uh, which becomes sort of very important and a series of sequences of space. This is a bedroom suite which can open up and become one. There are blinds that are tucked in, that open out, uh, relationships to the outside, you know, the kinds of detail which are simple, subtle, but yet sophisticated for a client like that. And there are no paintings in the house and what we've got is every room has a colored window and through the day the light moves on the ceiling so you know what time of the day it is in a sense. So it kind of washes the house with this color. Without, um, and then this kind of transparency is discretion, but yet it's very, very transparent uh, and ambiguous in terms of the inside and outside. But then how do you, for a larger project, this was our first corporate building in 1994, long ago, uh, when India was just liberalizing, and the client was very confident, everyone in India wanted to do glass block buildings, and so he told us he had an Australian manufacturer who's going to supply the curtain glazing in four months. We should wait for it. He wants a high-rise tower. He said, I want the parking at the back. I have a garden in the front. If you can put a fountain in the center, I'll be thrilled. And we were so depressed with that grief uh, that we didn't know how to even respond. And of course, after much deliberation, we kind of took the stance that, look, in a point when we are liberalizing this economy, out the world, this is when we should be confident about actually tweaking our own kind of traditional vocabulary and creating an identity. One was obsessed with those ideas at that time, one might not do that today, but we came up with a, a building in a series of courtyards, uh, which is really a, a series of apertures which vary in scale and respond to a low-rise, high-density environment in which it's located. And it sits very easily there 
without becoming this monster of dark. Uh, but it also becomes one for passive cooling. This is the, the rain shadow, so it's very hot and dry. So it's a series of courtyards, all held in the clay, handmade tile roof. Um, it sort of cools the building as we go through it. And you can stand at that window and look right through the building on axis and a series of courtyards stack up. So it's very transparent and it doesn't sort of exclude, at least visually. Uh, and as you go through it, it's courtyards with water that cool the building in single loaded corridors. But it picks up on the intelligence of vernacular kinds of uh, residential and institutional buildings uh, in the area. Uh, and then we had a number of artists work with us on elements in the building like the sculpture seat, which becomes a place for meetings. Uh, or uh, as you go into the building, the scale diminishes where the owners sit, they have their own terraces, and you look down. So there's, there's a lot of change of scale through the building. But also elements of the railings for the bridge and the staircases were done by an artist called Manjit Bawa, uh, who took his two-dimensional paintings and converted them into these kind of uh, three-dimensional settings or, or presses in copper and other metals. Uh, which then decorated uh, the building. And these are all handmade clay tiles which are made in, in the region about 50 or 60 kilometers from there. A lot of material is recycled, like the scripts to make the waterfalls, uh, which then create the sort of unification uh, within, uh, within the building. And I mean, there's many aspects of this building, but an interesting aspect was an interpretation of the screens, which in Mughal architecture exist that allow luminosity, but they also filter light, but they also allow the air to go through it. And a whole series of these that control uh, through their density, they control uh, the filtration of, uh, of air and light through the building. And this was this is a machine tool company. This was a headquarters for a machine tool company. So with an artist, what we did was we picked up all the scrap from the machine tool pressing, and these grills were made using that scrap metal. And so it's really about the material that makes the company rich that people can actually feel, and that presence you know gets converted in a sense. Uh, into art, and it takes on about 35 such patterns at different scales uh, that go up to you know, large sort of sizes of 10 feet by 10 feet and incredible portals. And you know, I always get complimented by friends that it's so nice that you're looking at tribal art so seriously, and I don't have the heart to tell them it's scrap metal. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and so uh, moving on to corporate buildings like this, this is Bangalore, which is very cool, it's called the air conditioned city. And we were asked by Ewan Packard from California to design a campus for them. Uh, this is the Electronic City where Infosys is the biggest in, 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 in information technology company. These are essentially glass boxes with lawns and sprinklers. And it's kind of a really wasteful environment for that beautiful climate. And, and a part of the campus had been done by another architect, of course, I shan't name, uh, who created these sort of glass boxes. And, and you know, in analyzing it, we realize that this is all the software, what you see in yellow. And these are the common facilities like photocopy machines, coffee places, bathrooms, etc. And, and we found that these buildings actually excluded any form of interaction among the young people who work here 24-7. And so we kind of reconfigured that by stringing all the common facilities to make a, stri a street, plugging on the software with lots of green and water bodies and anchoring it with food courts at the end. So about 3,000 people work there. It's a large complex for so Europe Packer. They service all their computers. And it's a call center. Uh, but they also do software projects. Uh, and so it, it's a completely different paradigm. The one thing we learned was that what these software buildings all tend to do, these are just plans that are imported uh, from all sorts of places. They do two things. One is they don't connect people at all. They disconnect people. Some of it is for privacy, but some of it is just for design. And the second ironic thing about them is they spend a lot of money on curtain glazing, but then they spend lots more money on automated blinds because they get glared on account of the curtain glazing in a country like India. And so this is a mad contradiction. And so the building we finally did was half the price and much more efficient. Uh, the plan is very diagrammatic because of the site, but it's highly efficient. Uh, what you see in gray are the non-air conditioned areas. Now what was interesting is it's 200 square feet per ton of air conditioning, which is business as usual. If you do 290, you begin to qualify for a LEED certificate. We disqualified for a LEED certificate only because we were looking at national ventilation. Uh, the LEED didn't have that as an accounting system uh, 10, 12 years ago. Now, so you get an efficient system at 290. We managed to get 305 square feet per ton, but by just not air conditioning 60% of the space. So it was a low cost 
passive kind of approach to it. And of course, the Hewlett Packard in California was, con was convinced, and they said you don't need the certificate if you get that efficiency. So except for the light gray, which is the call centers, you don't need to air condition anything else. And there are a few conference rooms here where they do Skype calls and things which needed to be air conditioned. The rest is not air conditioned. It's a wonderful climate. You don't need air conditioning, and people are happy without it. And that's what it looks like. These are the conference rooms. The stairs are all clad in copper, so they can kind of identify. You can walk under these. These are all the conference rooms, so they're very easily identified because they lurch out and they provide shade for people walking through it. The street that I was talking about has got this kind of double and triple height spaces. It's a very social space where people can meet, the terraces, they can hang out. It's all naturally ventilated. They go to the food court together. So it's a very social building just through design. This is the food court, totally naturally ventilated, with different scales of spaces where people can interact. And these are young people, 3,000 people, average age, 24. Every time I walked in there, I could feel the average age going up because they were so young. And they worked there 24-7, uh, 365. And to make it a social space uh, becomes really critical. And these are the software blocks. Very little glass, just at eye level, so you get no glare. Pergolas, bamboo cords, so it's in beautifully insulated and incredibly efficient. But also it is a form of architecture that, that invests in the place. If you can imagine it as becoming something else. I can imagine it becoming a university if your Packard decides to get onto that 747 and move the corporation. So it becomes a piece of architecture that's institutional and invested uh, rather, rather than something that's very brittle. In Hyderabad, this last project in this corporate sector, where a construction company asked us to do uh, office building. And of course, global, you know, they were going to become cutting edge and all of that. And this is in Hyderabad, that's Mario Hotel's building, and other architects who built here, but largely he's done building in brick, but all of these are just glass boxes. And that was kind of our site. And this is a high-tech company where every piece of equipment for their freeway is trucks. Tractor, everything has a camera on it, and like a NASA headquarter, they monitor everything sitting in this one room for efficiency. So they use, you know, high technology. Hyderabad also politically is an interesting place because the state is wanting to be divided, and so there are riots there like all the time. Now they finally resolved it somewhat, and so you know every global brand like Mercedes Benz and BMW, they all have these glass sort of boxes where they sell products, but all these office buildings because it's a big global center. Now what's interesting is because of the riots, every building is clad in fishing nets. And when you go to order working gazing, when they sell you the glass, they also show you options for colors and fishing nets. And the vendors actually give you the details for the fishing nets to protect the working gazing. Uh, so this was amazing because I felt that the, the power of these images that people were yet building these glass blocks with fishing nets um, uh, in a condition like this seemed very bizarre. So of course we were inspired again by low tech. These are Blinds that they use in places like Andhrabad, which they humidify and they cool the building. And we began to look very carefully uh, at uh, this uh, interesting uh, thing that the government sets up in places like Jaipur, which are very hot. They set up 200 of these huts. That guy works for the government. It's actually a water cooler. And so uh, he puts his kettle out and he's open for business. Uh, it's hygienic, clean water, cool water. People come, they just cup their hands, so there are no paper glasses or plastic cups or anything, and they drink water. And uh, it's a service the government provides, it's social infrastructure, if you might call it that. It's only for the summer. Every once in a while, when the sun comes out, it gets hot, he comes and sprays the water. So through evaporative cooling, the hut stays cool, which means he's comfortable. Uh, and he just dampens the whole thing, the air goes through it, it's hot air becomes quite cool and very beautiful and the earthen pots which also because of their porosity uh, but through evaporative cooling they stay very cool uh, and it's such a beautiful thing he talks to these people it's aesthetically so beautiful so humane uh, that the service is provided so this was very inspirational and we said we've got to somehow translate this uh, into a building and we came up with a kind of idea to do a, a it's not a green wall, it's a garden that goes up five floors, but it also has a system of humidification. So it uses that same principle in a hot dry climate, where if you humidify that skin, people can control the window and they get actually cool air. So it's a very simple sort of idea, where you have a trellis, you have a business as usual spec building, and then you have a garden that grows on it. Uh, every facade could potentially be different, and we tried that out by going to the nursery. So imagine leaving the scaffolding on and then letting it 
it's a creepers, but you know, we also had to design for the fact that the plants died or something. So that's what the trellis turned out to be. It was handcrafted in a little place just outside Hyderabad. And we got a contractor who had done those uh, beautiful grills that I showed you. And he said, if you give me two years, I can set up a business with 20 people. And so he became self-sufficient. So it became a business that we landed up setting up to do this trellis. Uh, and of course, talking about inflation capital, these clients wanted to inaugurate the building. So we inaugurated the building in 12 months. Uh, the cows came, invested, and everything. And then we, we told them that we'd grow the facade over the next two or three years. So by detaching those two elements, we could get something that we wanted to craft, but they could also use the building in the way they wanted. And, and so this is just a video that shows you the operation that was just set up in this factory, especially for the building, and now it's become a, a, you know, a viable little building. We could only afford one mold in the budget, and that's why it took so long. Uh, it employs women. Uh, it, uh, we, we studied special alloys because we wanted a we wanted a finish that was very particular. We didn't want an anodized aluminium. We wanted the building to look beautiful even if the plants didn't grow in the way it got sand. Every component was really small that one or two people could deal with it. Uh, uh, they were anodized. Uh, as you can see here, it was a very large anodizing tank. All very low tech. They were stacked up here. And when they were enough to fill a small uh, wagon, they would be taken to site. And two people could assemble it on the scaffolding. And as this got assembled, the scaffolding got removed. Uh, there you see it in its early stages with the misting system, which was in, in different quadrants because different plants need different kinds of water. Although this misting doesn't water the plants, there's a hydroponic tray system, which I'll show you in a second. But this cools it. So you can actually create a cloud around the building on a hot day. You can control it for different facades, uh, depending on the east west and where you're getting the sun uh, and where you need the water if things are drying up. Uh, and, uh, you know, it becomes a, a, and it recycles the water. gives you the kind of effect of coolness of the rain. Uh, the, the gardeners who are all over the building create patterns, the plants create patterns, so the presence of nature in a sense is kind of walking present, it changes with the sunlight, so you're very kind of aware of that. And that's the landscape around it, which is kind of very ordinary and also almost kind of oppressive. So it kind of grows, it becomes a woolly monster, and it's going to cut back, it grows again. So it's kind of really dynamic. Uh, and it's a very simple principle, that's the trellis, and there's a wraparound which was attached. Uh, uh, you know, two ways, there's a podium under which all the parking goes, but you've got a very usable garden on top, which people can socialize on. You know, the butterfly watching uh, their decks where people can meet. Uh, okay. Of course, these are the different plants that sort of grow at different times. But even sectionally, it's a series of courtyards that also help to move hot air out. So it's a very interesting section in the kinds of spaces it creates based on different departments. That's the corporate, the tendering department, which means the word secrecy is like a flat sort of slice in between. And this is all the social areas, auditorium, gyms, um, and uh, cafeterias. That's the cafeteria. We put the gym in the middle of the cafeteria so as people work out. And of course, we are now trying to study and do feedback. It was very intuitively done, and through requests from friends who are sort of green architects and work on all of this stuff, we have begun to map uh, what it might mean. But you know, also as in the, the famous building in London, it's a private Jaguar. I think a building like that, which has a LEED certificate, what it does to the public realm is disgusting. And this building doesn't have a LEED certificate. But I mean, I think it is as efficient as what you. But also, what it's, it's more responsible to the public realm. I mean, look at that with the lead certificate. The kind of glare that that creates is, is, is really crazy. So how does one take these standards into the public realm, I think, become uh, very, very important. And that's the hydroponic tray. Uh, so the gardeners can actually access all the areas. It, it's a good two and a half, three feet away. Uh, and that's the interesting thing for me about the building. Coming back to the notion of soft thresholds. What's interesting about this building, partly deliberate, and partly sort of exaggerated in its actual existence, is in a typical corporate building in India, 
the boss would drive in on a tip tip car, the city's venues, there'd be workers toiling in the gardens, no one would even make eye contact. Here, the poorest employees of this corporation, which are the gardeners, can actually transgress any space in the building. And what's interesting is these are in a way true green jobs because the identity of the building depends on these gardens. And you know, this woman you'll see here, this isn't a staged picture. The fact that she's wearing a sari like that is because she knows she's going to be in the glare of the bosses. And you know, they've made friends, people have requests to catch a butterfly and put in a bottle for a daughter, or on her birthday, people make bouquets of flowers. There's an amazing interaction that's happened between the poorest in the building and the richest. And so, I mean, I think architecture can, as an instrument, allow these kinds of transgressions. And it is a very powerful instrument to do that, to be aware of these social inequities, even if they're gestures, even if they're beginnings, I think they're very important. So those are truly the heroes of a building, in a sense, in the way sort of it sits in that landscape. So let's go to these localized sort of programs. This is for Magic Bus, and it's an interesting NGO that works in Mumbai that takes slum kids, networks them, and then creates a campus, which is what we designed for them, where they go for recreation, they go for lessons in nutrition, and things like that. And of course, the client's brief here was, we want to evoke the feeling of an Indian village. And I thought that was so ridiculous, because these kids, for three generations, have grown up in the slums. The parents don't even go back to the villages. Often, they've run away from the villages because of oppression, because of bonded labor. So it's a crazy thing to make that reference. So we instead set ourselves the agenda of studying the slums. And we set ourselves a limitation that we said we would build this campus only from materials that are found materials in squatter settlements or favelas. And we did this for two reasons. We said there should be a sense of familiarity. And these might be my own crazy aspirations, but there should be a sense of familiarity. But also these kids who are now six, seven, and eight who are going to go to this campus, if they see those same materials reconfigured in more sophisticated ways, maybe when they repair their houses as they become teenagers, because these favelas are going to be there for the next decade or two, whatever our politicians might say, that they might actually have an impact in the way we can engage them with the built environment. So this is what I mean by the agendas that we can bring to bear, because it becomes research agenda, it becomes an agenda that might actually resonate in some way. Uh, and there's no reason, it's a win-win situation to bring these other agendas. And for me, this agenda was informed by the idea that favelas are going to be there, there's going to be another generation, we've got to reconfigure them, upgrade them in, in situ, even if temporarily. And so it's a large campus, so we designed it as a series of pavilions, so that people could add and people are active, adding. This is a gateway building, these are dorms. That's a dining facility based on the contours and things, and that's a thing for volunteers. Uh, and it sits on this sort of landscape. And we also imagine these as typologies that could be re-embedded in the slum. So this is just a Photoshop image where we've used the same materials that you see in the favela, but we've reconfigured them. But we also imagine the dormitory with the toilet as becoming a community center with a toilet. Or the dining facility becoming a big veranda with a clinic. And so how could then it become a project where you treat it as a research project to really embed some of these lessons where these boys and girls come from. And so it's very simple materials, uh, you know, the open verandas for dining, just bamboo sort of screens. These are dormitories where every child has access to a window because this is a massive luxury that in a slum they can never be near a window or light. So the fact they can control a window is almost a luxury of most densities. But it really is trying to look at the intelligence of how these things are made, where you have a base that's made masonry, an upper story is added very quickly because often it's illegal. But we were being inspired by some of those tactics in a sense to come up with using the same material for a completely different vocabulary, and then that's the gateway building, etc. And how you can become re embedded in the slum. These are just fantasies. But at that point, we also were looking at sanitation questions, and I met a friend of mine close friend called Sheila Patel, who runs an NGO called Spark, and they've just been appointed by the World Bank to build 300 toilets, public toilets, for favelas or slums. So by now, I asked who, who is designing these. I thought, what a wonderful project. And she said, no, we talked to some architects, some young architects, they weren't interested, and now engineers are doing it. And I thought that was ridiculous, and I said, look, you have our services, we do it in an honorary capacity. And I realized that architects hadn't taken it because this was doomed for failure in some way. The World Bank had specs which were ridiculous. Uh, it's not easy to work in these favelas for toilets. So we began to look at this. And it's really interesting to see this. And this is for this generation of students 
you know, they, we talk about the informal city for a minute. There's going to be three billion people who live in the informal city, uh, uh, you know, by 50. Uh, it's, it's your, this is the constituency that, and public health is a level up. If these problems occur in Latin America, Africa, and South Asia, you don't have public health problems here in the West, in more developed economies, etc. This is a global problem, period. And I think we as a community have to engage in it. Now, if you look at the literature on these aspects, it's denial when nation states were acquiring their birth because people didn't want to see for well because new nations were being born, especially in the developing world. Then it was eradication as capitals were being built and people were investing in new architecture. Tolerance when in democracies governments realized that they could get votes out of these places. And then improvement uh, as they began to see these as large vote types. Of course, we have to, as architects, anticipate the problem through these meta narratives that I was referring to construct ways in which we can anticipate what these problems will be. And of course, it means looking at regional scales, looking at affordable land, mobility. I don't want to go into that. A lot of what we do in our studios, or at least I do in our studios, explores those ideas at a mega scale. But you, it is a reiterative process. We have to go back. But I think there is a lot of value in looking at the micro in a problem like this. This is an image which I describe as an accident. I took this image and downloading it on my computer, I was really moved to tears when I saw it because what it made me think was this. You can't see it because of the projection, but uh, a white shirt, white socks. He's running off to school. He lives in the slum. He's defecated in the open before getting ready for school. He doesn't have access to a toilet. And to see someone so intact and millions of kids like this around the world, it's really mind-boggling that the agency of design and our engagement in this could be, we don't know even where to start, and that's a problem. These are the statistics. In Mumbai, it's one toilet for 1,440 people. That means virtually there are no toilets. I mean, a few people, because the rich have four toilets a person, but that's another story. And of course, NGOs have a softer view of it. The Bombay Municipal Corporation says, no, it's only one is to 150, but that's even disgusting in itself. And, and then their target is one is to 50, which means one toilet for six families, essentially. Which means, what, you'd have to have a lottery system to use the toilet every morning? It's impossible. I mean, even the aspiration is so disgustingly pathetic. And so it's a massive, massive, massive problem. And you know, our present Prime Minister has promised to be a toilet for everyone, etc. This is a design problem. You can't take a prefab toilet and dump it outside everyone's house. That doesn't work. We have to think of community toilets to make a transition before infrastructure systems can come in for individual toilets. This is a it's a it's a problem of imagining transitions from a pathetic state to one where hopefully every family will have at least a toilet. But this is an interdisciplinary problem which is complex, but it's something we can't avoid if we have to give agency to design and we have to establish our position in society. And you know, looking at these toilets. It, everyone was defecating everywhere but inside the toilet. And you know, contractors run these toilets. They take out the bulbs because they save electricity and they save money. So it's a very complex problem. So we came up with a prototype using the World Bank specs, which were concrete and things which we would never do if we didn't have that limitation. Because when you imagine it as a transition, it's quite different. And we, we came up with a stack toilet system where the women and children could be on top because there's a huge problem for women going to toilets at night for children get abused and things. And so the men would be down here. And what we did, which was very interesting, is we took the caretaker's house, the person who cleans the toilets, who's usually the lowest class, and we gave him a house on the top and actually gave him or her the prime position. Now this was a tricky thing to do, but we felt very strongly about it. We felt, you know, in India you could do this. Uh, we created a community center there where uh, children and women could do adult education. Kids could study because they don't have lights in their houses. And then I went to a client that I'd done one of those nice weekend houses for and I told them this sad story and I saw him sort of, uh, his eyes twitching and I asked for a donation for solar panels. <laughs> solar panels. So because the World Bank didn't have that in their spec. And that got up to the grid, which means that this community space would be lit, it would become a beacon. And it was interesting. So we designed these and we went and made presentations to the municipality and then you see the slum. And the municipality didn't think about it, but when we started construction and we reached the plinth level, they came and they put a stop order on it. So I went to meet the municipal commissioner, and I said, like, what's the problem? You cleared it. He said, no, no, we hadn't realized that this building is too iconic for the slum. So I said, what do you mean by that? They said, you've created a community center. These people are going to organize themselves. 
And we are actually trying to relocate them because the developer has agreed to relocate them and they're going to give him a bonus FAR on this. And so you know, all that politics began to play out. And I realized, my God, this is a case where architecture actually works against society in this case because one has maybe been overstepped through design and been too ambitious about it. So we said, let's go to another location. We found a smaller slum on the periphery of the city. We thought no one would notice. And we came up with this sort of much more modest uh, sort of toilet. And the same thing happened. And then I said, let's go to an inaccessible place. And like impatient capital, I had become this impatient designer who wanted to do this thing. And we built one. And it got built. It got beautifully used by these kids. That's public housing. They haven't moved into for 15 years. It became a community space. We used these lovely battery slats, all very low tech. Uh, we had the solar panels. The kids used it at night to study. It became really, really interesting. But then I went back six months later, and the government had built one of their prototypes. And this had been taken over by a group, and we had failed completely. And, you know, it, 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 it really, of course, it was obviously an overstep. We were in a hurry. This NGO we were working with had no connections in the community there, so there was no form of participation. How could we have done that? It was just this sort of uh, impatience, in a sense, to demonstrate what we felt was a good solution in this condition. And of course, that was a mistake. And it was a failure. And you know, I always say that, uh, I mean, Beckett sort of helped me through this. He said, ever try, ever fail. No matter, try again, fail again, fail better. And you know, I mean, I think that's, at universities, I sort of suggest you should actually have a conference, call 10 really well-known architects, to present one project that failed. We don't have a language to discuss failure in a sense. Uh, and so we began to evolve this. This was a competition by the Gates Foundation. We won the first prize. It was an international competition. We've reconfigured the material. We've embedded it much more in the community. We're developing it as a prototype. Nothing has happened with it. It was just a competition. But you know, I think this is such a big problem that we have to all be committed to. I'm going to end with this last project, which is a, a low-cost housing project. And these are both my clients. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's related to failure because architecture is often like riding an elephant and the elephant throws you off, tramples on you and you can decide to give up or you can decide to get out of the elephant. And the thing about the mammoth and the elephant is they have a very complex relationship. The mammoth sings to the elephant. Only the mammoth can control the elephant. And so I think the architects also have to develop that kind of uh, approach and complexity of relationships in order to survive. Elephants came to Rajasthan, this is a project in outside Jaipur by accident. They were actually bought by the Mughal for farm uh, and for celebration. And uh, they, they are now in a desert climate. They take tourists up and down these ramparts, which is pathetic. They go rogue. I actually, they actually kill tourists on these ramparts. It's never in the press, but I know that for a fact from operator friends. Uh, because in the heat, they just can't take it. They get painted. This discolors their skin because there's not enough water. This is where the government had housed them, like garages. And the mounds were on top. It never worked, so the mounds had to sleep here. It was a competition. The site we finally discovered had been quarried by sand contractors. So it was a series of pits. But I think what we did was we converted it into a landscape project. We said, this is, it was very difficult. We said, architecture background. Forget the architecture. If we can't have water here, these animals can't survive. So it became a landscape project. And through micro dams, how we collect water, where these depressions already existed. And through Google, we could see the flow of water. And it became very evident to us how we could capture it. And that became the site plan. And what was left over land became land for the housing. The rest was really dedicated to water. And that became the site plan using species. We kept places for visitor centers, all sorts of things. And it's 100 elephants and the families of the mountains, which is what it's all And that's what we managed to achieve in 2007. That's the site we got, that hill. In three years, by just capturing the water, we transformed. That's the same hill that we see there. The whole ecology of the place transformed completely just by capturing water for three years. It became habitable. Now there's enough water, of course, for the year, 400 elephants. I won't go into these things. Uh, and of course, it was also about uh, breaking away from the government prototype of row houses, which is what it's, it's 40 square meters per unit, which is 400 square feet. It's pathetically low, but by arranging each unit around the courtyard, you already increase it by 30%. And then by having a big courtyard between three units, you've actually made the house four times its size because people are going to live out and use the courtyard and create a sense of community, which is what we finally did, and that's what you see in 
people's plans, they see that it's basically open, they have separate access because the children, they can be dangerous. And of course, we studied it in terms of incrementalism, how it could grow, how it could adapt. And, and you know, that's what a site does it look like. These elephants are of different sizes, so, and the elephants can't uh, sleep on flat ground, they have to have a mound, otherwise they can't get up. So for every size, you have to actually have a profile that's very appropriate, and so that will, when I publish this project, it's also going to be called small, medium, large, extra large. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what it sort of looks like, like when it was completed, these are designed to store hair, hair. that's why they're steel structures, but they also create insulation at critical places where the elephants live, you can see the water in the beginning, that's Bear Palace, where they actually take the tourists, so they walk much, much closer. Otherwise, they used to walk 11 miles to work every morning, but now they live very close, so it becomes very convenient uh, for them. But essentially, it, it really is uh, about how. Oh, sorry, this is a Maybe I can't get to work on You know how it is. But uh, so that's what it sort of looks like. It's not plastered. These are windows of children, and they play and also make be friendly with their friends. So there are many little moments like that which are uh, focused on the people who inhabit this and the way they might set up those relationships. Uh, and uh, when it gets, becomes ownership, which it will after all the applications, they paint it, decorate it. Rajasthan has a very rich sort of tradition. Um, you know, this is a uh, Mahal coming home to his family. Different people have done different things uh, with their clusters and the way they developed it. Now what's interesting here, this is by default accidentally, there is more water here than these people need. So they grow flowers and they create income out of that. So the middle class in Jaipur have to get water tankers in the sun. So just through design here, because we made it a landscape project, you corrected an inequity by default. So these people are actually empowered just through the fact that they have access to so much water in their proximity and they are really poor. A mom earns 5,000 rupees a month, that's $100. And he supports a family and partly feeds the elephant from that. But what has happened as a result of this is, uh, you know, they have other forms of income because they can empower themselves through the water. Life corrodes housing and now trees are growing. People are using outdoor spaces in different ways. The boats have arrived. The trees have grown. Uh, you can see how much it's transformed. The dish antennas. It's become a completely different habitat just because of the water. Uh, and of course, now there are many other improvements that are happening government put some money into now line the water bodies which was a problem. Uh, some parts which are the lowest parts of the site where water now drains automatically and become like forests. They become really thick uh, in terms of their vegetation and habitat. Elephants also can't be left alone. They've got to hang out together. So we had to make these little pavilions where they could meet for a few hours. And when that started happening, another generation of the Mahout's kids who are teenagers used that in a very intelligent way. They started a company called Elephant Time, which has a website. So tourists who now visit can book times and come and feed the elephants while they're hanging out together. And so these kids now make money from this. So there's a whole ecology of economy uh, that is sort of uh, developing uh, uh, around this uh, as a result. And you know, of course, I mean, your generation, you are what your Facebook page is. So these guys go and post stuff stuff on Facebook. And, uh, you know, now we've sort of done design so visitor center. These are self-initiated. I mean, our fees ran out on this long ago, but we're committed to making this project happen. Uh, and this is a new generation that kids there, the 60 kids, an American NGO, uh, put some money in and we renovated some structures that had existed on the site by adding this beautiful wall. And uh, now it's become a new school that these kids go to. So the point here is that by taking a completely different approach, by receiving architecture in a sense to the background, because here, given the budgets, unless we had the landscape in place and created this armature or, or ecology for all of this to thrive, it would have been a disaster project. So I just want to end with a few thoughts. I'll end in a minute. You know, what I'd like to say is that I think as the world and South Asia in particular become increasingly global, I think we have to be cautious about accepting that things are growing more alike because they begin to look more alike. Because when we engage with the deeper excavation on the site in which we operate, and understanding that draws both uh, on the objective realities of the site as well as the subjective perceptions of the site, actually the differences emerge more strikingly than before. Where differences were actually assured when things look different. So architects will have to find more rigorous ways of defining the complex, emerging cultural fabric of multiple aspirations in places like India, which has a mutinous democracy, in many other parts of the world where I think these issues 
are quite similar. But more importantly, to see the cultural fabric as an ever evolving landscape. I mean, I think both identity and culture are not static. They're not found things. They're things that you construct continuously. It's what society values and what we associate ourselves with what becomes culture and identity. In the words of Arjun Apudaraj, the anthropologist, culture is a dialogue between aspirations and sedimented traditions. So in these interpretations that we as designers make of a place or of culture, ideas of the future, as much as those about the past, necessarily need to be nurtured, embedded, and evolved. And that's why I think imagining the context of the context simultaneously is what gives it a kind of dynamic spin, but an incredible challenge to us, and a nourishment to us, and an inspiration to us as designers. Because I think in the highly pluralistic environments, at least of South Asia, but I think of the world today, we require planning and design mechanisms and attitudes that continually negotiate between these differences. Architecture as the sole instrument for place making, or temporality as the sole instrument, as, as a condition for, say, celebration or for habitation. The question of the state and the market, how do we dissolve this, the empowered and the poor. Rather than allow one entity to prevail and remake the city or the broader environment in its own image. And for me, this is what makes working in Mumbai and the landscape of India unique and challenging. Because I believe once the architect sees these various differences as being simultaneously valid, that is critical if we have to think of synthesis and the blurring of these values. Because we have to see the simultaneous validity. Then the challenge is to go beyond their polarized boundaries, the simplicity, and to deal with these different worlds, deferring adjacencies, questions of scale, how do you bring these different worlds together in a schizophrenia? Can you design with a divided mind? I think that challenge is when, I mean, I think that's when we really create the space in which we, as architects, the agency of design, will engage with not only architecture and nature, but more importantly, with society more meaningfully. Thank you very much. Finally, found that the only way to solve problems in both cities was to just ship about four million people from 
in way to Detroit. <laughs> and, um, so I think it really has to do with different paradigms that respond to different forms of density. So again, I think it's a matter of this binary that we set up. So we look at high density conditions and we have a particular vocabulary that defines that. And what we attribute is uh, aspects that are positive and whatever. Then we have a whole discourse about sprawl and about, and I was struck very much about being around Austin this morning and fortunate one for taking me around because I said that there's a downtown, there's a forest but They said, no, no, there's a city below this forest. And so it took me through this city, which is quite wonderful and quite beautiful. And it's a different paradigm. And I think, uh, I think we have to, I think we have to, to find solutions. We can create a kind of antagonistic position about low density and we can, you know, say good things about high density or vice versa. But I think we have to accept the simultaneous validity of both. And I think within those territories, there are different kinds of solutions that we have to look at. So having said that, I think what extreme conditions like Mumbai, etc., treat you, that teach you, is how these can dissolve. It teaches you about questions of what I was calling soft thresholds, how you can weave communities together. I mean, here you have a different problem with the lower density you have much heavier infrastructure which divides spaces and things. Uh, and I think also it can teach you that the temporal landscape is a very powerful instrument. And so I think J.D. Jackson wrote many years ago um, and he talked about how when human beings are nomadic was one thing and he kept goes on, it's very beautifully written, I can't say it so well, but he basically talks about the city beautiful and Vienna and places where, you know, which epitomize uh, settlement in a sense at its high point. But it also created forms of separation through zoning, through exclusively the rich and the poor, and all of that. And then he speculated, and this is writing in the early 70s, I believe, he speculated that it's going to be temporal events that are going to bring people together in cities again. And he talked about a circus coming to town and how kids from all communities go there and suddenly people become aware of the rich and the poor all in the same tent or markets that are temporary. And so I think for me in Mumbai, what I see with the temporal landscape, it's actually a very powerful instrument in the way it creates these transgressions across the city. Now, that might not be the final solution, uh, because I think we have to also think in terms of transitions. Uh, you know, it then could lead to something else, to the way people begin to connect with each other. So I think, I think there are many ideas like that that one could use in productive ways, uh, where I think the problems of many societies around the world today are quite similar. Uh, as Sukhetu Mehta said, you know, as in New York, every day is being born an Indian. Similarly, in Mumbai, every day is going to be born a New Yorker. And you're going to have, a, a, you know, a mobility of demography uh, for the generation of students that I can see here, which is going to be amazing. And ways of doing things in different places are going to become much more open and much more flexible. Uh, and I think this can be carried over in interesting ways. I and mean, just look at the success of even farmers' markets. I remember my kids, when we went to Ann Arbor for the first time to study, you know, they came back from school really excited one day and they said, you've got to come with us, we're to the farmer's market with our teacher today. So I went with them the next Thursday to the farmer's market and I had to remind them, look, your whole city looks like a farmer's market and you've forgotten Mumbai. <laughs> and I, I, it also made me think that uh, the, the farmer's market of the temple actually exists. The guys who sell Prada fakes on Manhattan sidewalk and run away putting it on in a blanket in a cop shop is, is, is it's a percentage of that temporal landscape and markets and this exists everywhere. The thing in Mumbai is 70% of the landscape in Manhattan it's 20% or 10% and I think we can use these more instrumentally uh, in a sense. Margaret Crawford's work uh, sort of speaks about a lot of this in a very particular situation in California and I think climate has a big role to play here because um, these are also responses that are uh, particular climatic situations which then result in the cultures mentioned. So, so I mean I think it's a much more complicated question. It's hard to say that it's X, Y, and Z that you could use in Austin, but I think we can think about this differently and more instrumentally and it opens up other possibilities. But I think the starting point for us is to not bring paradigms to judge other paradigms, but to first start by accepting the simultaneous validity of many different You have to be much louder.
you know, a combination of both. I mean, I think a good education is one that makes, well, makes you open-minded, but it makes you be a continuous learner. Uh, and I think that's a good education, because you can't do those three years learn everything. But you can learn to learn everything. So uh, I think uh, it's a combination of both. I mean, I studied in the School of Architecture in Ahmedabad at a very wonderful moment where it was a very robust institution with had people from all over the world coming. I'll never forget my first semester there, I heard Aldo Ganai, Paolo Soleri, Bhagavan Sakura, all in the first three months. So of course it was a place that uh, you know, blew your mind in the way of what you were exposed to. But finally, I mean, I think a good education is one that prepares you to learn all your life. So you shouldn't feel anxious about, my God, I haven't been exposed to this, I don't understand sustainability. I mean, I think it's more important to engage with every problem uh, the best you can, uh, being as plural about your explorations in terms of engaging other kinds of people, listening to people, uh, because I mean, I think that's the really part of the process, to be able to have the ability to learn forever. So, so we're going to continue, I think that you want to take more questions? You decide. <laughs> okay, one more question. Igor is the chair of the lecture, so he can so he can walk. So one more question. <laughs> Thank you very much.